It is unfortunate that perpetrators of murder are not always caught, despite the efforts to do so. How the police investigate these crimes has immeasurably improved over the last hundred years and continues to do so. But sometimes the truth and the solution to the case evades them. We all want a resolution to a crime to bring the culprit to justice. But sometimes this does not happen, despite the hopes of the authorities and the wider community, not to mention the victim's family and friends of those affected. This episode covers three unsettling unsolved crimes from across England, all that still pose questions today. We start with a curious case from the south of the country. It is a classic unsolved murder committed near midnight with all the ingredients of mystery. It was the morning of June the 1st, 1902, in the quiet Suffolk village of Peasonhall, when William Harsant headed to Providence House to bring his daughter Rose some clean linen. On entering, he saw her lying in a pool of blood at the bottom of the stairs in the kitchen. Her throat was cut, and she had numerous gashes on her shoulders and stab wounds. If this wasn't bad enough for her poor father to witness, her nightdress had also been burned, and parts of her lower body were charred, as if someone had tried to dispose of the evidence by burning it. The police were quickly called to the scene. She had been dead for roughly four hours, and was later found to have been six months pregnant at the time of her death. The cause was initially suspected to be suicide, but upon further investigation of her wounds and the surrounding evidence, the police concluded she was murdered. The occupants of Providence House were Baptist minister William Crisp and his wife. 22-year-old Rose was their live-in maid. The news of her death quickly spread throughout the village community and the police focused their sights on William Gardner a married man in his mid-thirties with six children, who was rumoured to be having an affair with Rose. The rumours and circumstantial pieces of evidence against Gardner didn't help his case. He was the choir master at the Methodist Chapel, and the choir members included Rose, who was also tasked with the job of keeping the place clean and tidy. The previous month, rumours had been circulating that the two were having an affair. Two locals, Alfonso Skinner and a Mr Wright, claimed to have seen Rose and Gardner entering another local church. They said they had heard Rose talking to Gardner about their relationship, while referring to Genesis chapter 38, which talks about sexual relations. Talk of Gardner and Rose's alleged affair quickly spread to others in the village, and Gardner was livid. He denied having any sexual relationship with her and demanded an apology from Skinner and Wright, but the two refused and said that they were being truthful. Gardner was a respected member of the community. The family lived on the main street of Peasonhall, in a small semi-detached cottage, within sight of Providence House, where the murder was committed. The scandalous rumour pushed church leaders to launch an informal investigation. However, there was no proof of the affair, other than statements of Skinner and Wright, and Gardner was adamant that he did not have a relationship with her, other than being her choir master. The police were aware of these rumours, and focused their attention on Gardner as the chief suspect. Several pieces of circumstantial evidence found at the crime scene pointed to him being the murderer. Near her body was paraffin in a prescription bottle addressed to Gardner and his wife, plus there were some romantic letters that were addressed to the victim. The most damning one hinted at an affair, saying, Dear R, I will try to see you tonight at twelve o'clock at your place. If you put a light in your window at ten, for a few minutes, then you can put it out again. The police reasoned whoever had written the letter 
was most likely the killer. There was also a newspaper at the scene that Rose's employers didn't subscribe to, but Gardner did. A post-mortem revealed the wounds on Rose's body. It appeared she'd been beaten, stabbed, and then had her throat cut. Marks on her hands suggested she had put up a pretty good fight before succumbing to her injuries. More interesting was the fact that Rose was found to be six months pregnant at the time of death. The police deduced that Gardner was the unborn child's father and had decided the best way to save his reputation was to kill Rose and her baby. The prescription bottle and newspaper both pointed to Gardner and his handwriting was similar to that of one of the letters. From there, things only got worse for him. A witness came forward and claimed they had spotted Gardner standing outside his home and gazing over at Providence House at around 10pm one night, watching the light from an upstairs window, just like in the letter. Another witness claimed on the day Rose's body was discovered, Gardner had lit a bonfire in his back garden, perhaps to get rid of his blood-stained clothes. More damningly, the police discovered he always carried around a small hinged knife on his person. On inspecting it, they found what appeared to be blood trapped in its hinge. Gardner, of course, denied he was involved in any way, but the police decided to go ahead and charge him with Rose's murder. William Gardner's case went to trial at Ipswich Assizes, held in the County Hall on the 7th of November 1902, and lasted three days. He pleaded his innocence, stating he had been first asleep at home the night Rose was killed. His wife backed him all the way. She even explained how she had given the prescription bottle to Rose, because the young woman had been feeling unwell. Rose must have simply filled the bottle with paraffin when she had finished the medicine. Gardner's wife even explained away the bonfire and the blood on her husband's knife. They were just coincidences. According to her testimony, Gardner had caught and killed a rabbit with the knife, and the bonfire had just been started to boil some water. One of Gardner's neighbours also came to his defence. She declared she hadn't been able to sleep the night of the murder, and she would have seen or heard if Gardner had gone out that night. She swore under oath that no one left the Gardner residence at the time in question. The defence argued that the child Rose was carrying at the time of her death could have been fathered by other men that she had relations with, and they pointed to love letters from different individuals found in her room. Their argument was basically by the time of her death, half of the men in Suffolk could have been the father or the murderer. The pieces of evidence presented by the prosecution were circumstantial at best, and the jury members weren't able to come up with a unanimous decision. They were deadlocked with 11 jurors voting for a conviction, and one saying there was no real evidence that showed Gardner was the murderer. It ended in a mistrial, and they ordered that a second trial should take place at the earliest opportunity. The second trial began two months later on the 20th of January 1903. No new real evidence had come to light in the intervening months, so the proceedings were basically a repeat of the first one. This time, the jury decided the opposite way. Eleven voted for acquittal, while one argued for Gardner's conviction. At the time, a unanimous verdict was needed in Britain for a conviction, and so Gardner was released a free man. Since 1974, a single juror's dissent does not prevent the jury from returning a majority verdict, but at the time, it did. The prosecution then issued a writ of nolle prosequi. This was distinct from the usual process of a formal acquittal. The consequence of this is that Gardner is one of the few people in English history to have been tried for murder and to have no verdict ever returned. 
A third trial was considered, but the authorities believed that they would end up with the same outcome, as there was no concrete evidence of Gardner's guilt. So who was the killer of Rose Harsent? Many do believe that Gardner did indeed get away with murder, but not everybody was convinced about this at the time. It has been suggested that it was Mrs Gardner who committed the deadly deed of ending Rose's life. Perhaps in a fit of anger and jealousy, she attacked her husband's supposed lover. Stranger things have indeed happened before. Another possible theory is that the murderer was a neighbour by the name of Frederick Davis. During the trial, it was revealed that many of the letters and poems that had been sent to Rose were from him. No other evidence has been uncovered, or any real motive has been given to back this up in any meaningful way, but it is at least possible. Most of those who lived in Peason Hall believed that Gardner was guilty, despite the lack of proof against him. He was neither convicted nor acquitted. After the trial, the Gardners decided to move away, and they started a new life in London. He lived the remainder of his life quietly until his death in 1941. As he was never formally acquitted, he had remained under a cloud of suspicion. No other individuals were arrested in connection to Rose Harson's death and the Peason Hall murder remains one of the most mysterious unsolved cases in England to this day. Everyone else involved around this case is also long gone, meaning the real murderer likely took their deadly secret to the grave a long time ago. A second case occurred in the late Victorian era and at the time was one of the most intriguing, capturing the country's imagination. It concerns the cold-blooded murder of a devoted wife and the search for the culprit. Tragedy hits the family again soon after, and two years later, another possible suspect is revealed. The case of Caroline Loire's grisly death is perhaps one of the country's most remarkable unsolved murder cases. It is full of intrigue, tragedy and mystery. It involved two pillars of late Victorian society, living out their retirement years in splendour in a picturesque part of West Kent. The crime captured the imagination of the nation with headlines across the national newspapers feeding the appetite of a thoroughly intrigued population. They were spared little detail or speculation on the case. It is August 1908, and the Luard family lived in an imposing house called Ingham Knoll, in the Kent village of Seal Chart, near Sevenoaks. 58-year-old Caroline was the wife of retired Major General Charles Luard, who was 12 years her senior. He had served in the Royal Engineers and was involved in several large building projects. They had two grown-up sons who were both in the army. The couple were well-known figures in the area where they had lived for the last 20 years. He had a distinguished military record, was a former county councillor and magistrate and was the governor of the local school. It was even said that he was friends with Winston Churchill. Caroline was involved in a variety of charitable work in the local area. At around 2.30pm on the afternoon of August the 24th, Caroline and her husband left their home to take their dog for a walk through a nearby wood. The Major General had planned to walk towards a summer house called La Casa on land owned by one of their neighbours before parting with his wife. He was going to walk to his nearby local golf club to collect his things ahead of a holiday the couple were planning to take. She was taking in the air 
before returning to the property to meet a friend, Mrs. Stewart, who was the wife of a local solicitor, for afternoon tea. After collecting his belongings, the Major General returned home to find his wife's guest had arrived, but there was no sign of his wife. After tea at around 4.30, he became concerned at her continued absence, so he decided to retrace their steps from previously in the day. At approximately 5.15, as he approached the summer house, his dog started to bark loudly. On the veranda of the rarely used building, he found Caroline lying on the floor. At first, he thought she had fainted, but soon saw blood underneath her head. She had been shot twice from close range, both in the head. One of the gloves had been pulled off and rings on one of her hands taken. A pocket on her dress had been ripped off. Her purse was gone. Distraught, he rushed to a nearby house to raise the alarm. It sparked a huge police investigation. The time of the murder was estimated to be 3.15pm, when her husband was walking towards the golf clubhouse. Three shots were heard at about that time by two witnesses. Annie Wickham, a long-standing local resident and wife of a coachman, and Daniel Kettle, a gardener. Wickham claimed the shots came from the direction of the summer house. She was at the Wilkinson's home at Frankfield House at the time which was about 500 yards from the scene of the crime. It didn't take long before idle gossip started to heap suspicion on the Major General. Had he killed his wife? However, he had an alibi. Several people living nearby testified to hearing gunshots at 3.15pm, yet the Major General was seen at the golf club by multiple witnesses at around the same time. He didn't have time to have killed his wife and make it to the club, looking relaxed. A local vicar also reported seeing him, and gave him a lift as he carried the sports gear home. The initial inquest hearing into the death was held at the Luard's home on the 26th of August. Dr Mansfield, who had carried out the post-mortem examination of the body, reported that Caroline had initially been hit on the back of the head, and that the blow had been of sufficient force to knock her to the ground. Her killer had then shot her behind her right ear, with a second shot being fired into her left cheek. A third bullet was found embedded in the door frame of the summer house. Prior to the inquest, her husband had written a statement for the police about the events of the afternoon of the 24th about which he was questioned at some length. In describing his discovery of his wife's body, he stated that, I then examined her dress and found it was torn. Her pocket at the back of the skirt had been torn open. One of her gloves, which was lying nearby, was inside out, as though it had been torn off. She had both gloves on when she left me. I then looked at her hands and saw that her rings were missing. She wore all her rings on her left hand, and always wore them, except when she washed her hands. One of the rings was over a hundred years old. It was an heirloom given to her by her mother. It was of an old design of mounting. He also admitted that he owned three revolvers, and claimed to be unable to remember where he kept his ammunition. The gun expert reported that after examining the bullets, he had concluded that they had come from a .32 revolver, which had been fired when the gun was no more than a few inches away from the victim's head. He also said that none of her husband's own revolvers would have been capable of firing such bullets, since his guns were all of a much smaller calibre. The police hoped that the pocket that had been ripped off the dress would lead them to her murderer. It was later found at Ingham Knoll, on the day before the funeral, by a maid who was shaking out the sheet in which the body had been carried back to the house. 
It was also hoped that the rings would be sold or pawned, and so provide a trail to the murderer. But they were never seen again. The inquest resumed a fortnight later at the Georgian Dragon pub. Charles Luard was again questioned and was asked by the coroner if he was aware of any incident in the life of the deceased or himself, which in his opinion would cause any person to entertain any feelings of revenge or jealousy towards either of them. His reply was a firm no, and said that neither of them had received any letters suggesting there had been such an incident. He also denied the allegation that his wife had received a letter prior to her death from someone seeking to make an appointment with her. Since the murder, a whispering campaign had been underway that suggested that her husband was the murderer, and that the theft of her rings was merely a device to throw the police off his track. Loire began to receive anonymous letters accusing him of the shooting. The volume of these letters and their vitriolic contents apparently persuaded him that he should leave the area, and he advertised the remainder of the lease on Ingham Knoll for sale and made arrangements to have the house's contents put up for auction. He was invited to stay with Colonel Charles Ward, who was the local MP and brother of the Chief Constable of Kent. Colonel Ward collected him at the end of the inquest proceedings on the 17th of September and drove him to his home, Barham Court, near Wateringbury. In the morning after breakfast, Luard then spent some time writing letters to his sons and to Colonel Ward. He then walked to the railway line at Teston, hid in some bushes and jumped in front of the 9.09am train from Maidstone to Tunbridge. He was killed instantly. One of the letters found at the house in which he stayed read, I am sick of the scandalous and lying reports. I cannot face my sons who I had arranged to meet today and have decided to end my life. He had pinned a note on his coat saying, Whoever finds me, take this to Colonel Ward. The eventual verdict of the inquest into the death of Caroline Luard was murder by person or persons unknown. Later on, it was determined that her husband had committed suicide while temporarily insane. The idea that the murderer was a hot picker or itinerant with a revolver in his pocket who was prepared to perpetrate a random killing for the sake of a few rings, of which he would not have been aware until he tore the glove off the victim's dead hand, was generally dismissed. The police seemed to have believed that the killer was known to Caroline, that the crime was planned, and that the theft of the rings was an attempt to mislead them about the motive for the murder. There has been speculation that the killer was John Dickman, who in 1910 was sentenced to death for the murder of a man called Nisbet on a train in Morpeth. Dickman's conviction was considered unsafe by a number of people, including five of the jury that found him guilty, and who later signed a petition calling for him to be reprieved. Sir Sidney Rowan Hamilton, who was the Chief Justice of Bermuda in the 1930s, wrote a book about the Dickman case in 1914 and was convinced that Dickman murdered Caroline Luard. He believed that she had responded to an advertisement that Dickman had placed in the Times, asking for financial help by sending him a cheque. Dickman had subsequently forged this cheque, presumably by changing the amount. And when Caroline discovered this, she contacted him and arranged to meet him without her husband's knowledge. It has also been claimed that the judge who tried Dickman, the three appeal court judges who heard and rejected his appeal, and the Home Secretary, Winston Churchill, who refused to commute Dickman's death sentence, were all friends of Charles Luard and bent on avenging his and his wife's deaths. To this day, the case file is still marked unsolved.
Our final story is from the early part of the 20th century and centres on the northwest of England. Despite two trials after a lengthy police investigation into a number of suspects, no one was ever convicted, and the real motive or motives remains a mystery. One evening on the 10th of September 1909, outside of Gorse Hall in the Cheshire town of Stallybridge, a shot rang out and smashed the glass in one of the downstairs windows. The owner, George Stalls, rushed out into the garden, shouting as he did so at the perpetrator, who disappeared without a trace. The house was the home of Stalls and his wife Maggie. He had inherited control of his father's very successful building business, which he continued to run. To the public, the marriage appeared loveless and childless, unlike that of George's older brother James, and it is possible that this was the cause of friction between the two of them. But there was good evidence of Maggie and George sharing a deep love for each other. Cornelius Howard, a cousin of George's, was originally a petty thief, but joined the British army and rose to the rank of bombardier. Cornelius was not liked by George, and when he approached him for a job at the company, George flatly refused. George's friend, Robert Innes, a local solicitor, employed a governess for his children, and George was rumoured to have begun a relationship with a young woman, who was called Maria Hull. She suddenly decided to leave Stallybridge, purportedly to attend Oxford University. She then returned equally as suddenly some eight months later, but did not see George again. It was again rumoured that Maria gave birth to a child during her absence from Stallybridge. Not longer after her return, she committed suicide by drowning herself in the local canal. After Maria's death, George started receiving anonymous threatening letters. He may have felt he had a debt to pay, and therefore feared a reason that he could be killed. Shortly afterwards, Gorse Hall was attacked by the intruder who fired a gun through the window. The attack made the police start patrols of the area, and a bell was installed to summon help in case of a repeat. On the evening of the 1st of November, George, his wife and a family friend, Miss Linley, were playing cards in the living room as their maid was preparing the dining table for supper. In the kitchen all was usual, that is until the cook saw a man standing by the back door. He pointed a gun directly at her. Not a word, he threatened, or I'll shoot you. He had made no attempt in disguising himself, and the cook had a good chance of seeing his face, but she was too frightened to do anything but escape, running into the living room and screaming that there was a man in the house armed with a gun. George immediately ran into the hall, and there was confronted by the intruder. What happened between them, whether any words passed, no one knows. Mrs. Stores and Miss Lindley did not follow him immediately, but when they saw the two men struggling violently, Miss Lindley ran out of the house to summon help from one of the neighbours and did not return for fifteen minutes, whilst the cook and the maid fled to the coachman's cottage to get assistance. During the ongoing scuffle, the gun got dislodged from the attacker's hand, and the two men continued grappling each other and somehow ended up in the kitchen. When Miss Linley arrived back at the house with Richard Ashworth, they found that the front door was locked, so immediately went round the back to the kitchen door. On entering, they both discovered the shocking sight of George lying on the floor in a pool of blood. A police constable arrived at the scene a few moments later. George was barely alive, and the constable asked him if he knew who the attacker was. The muffled reply was that he did not. Apart from asking for his wife, 
This was all the dying man said. Nothing could be got from him as to who his assailant was or why the latter should attack him, and in about twenty minutes he died. He had been stabbed many times, and from the blood trail it was evident that the violent struggle had swayed between the hallway and the kitchen. One would have thought that the knife and the pistol left behind would have furnished clues on which the police might have acted. But nothing came of them. The murderer's motive might have been robbery, or it might have been revenge. The theory of robbery was hardly tenable, and the police set to work in another direction. They looked into whether any disgruntled former employees may have been responsible, but this was said to be unlikely by George's brother James. While the police were making their inquiries, the tragedy was deepened by the news that the coachman who worked for the Stalls family had hanged himself. His suicide, it would appear, had nothing whatever to do with the murder beyond the fact that the man had been depressed by the death of his employer, to whom he was greatly attached. The police had gathered statements from the family, which led them to be on the lookout for Cornelius Howard, the errant relative of George. The description of the murderer given by Miss Linley, Mrs. Stalls, and the servants was that he had light blue eyes, a fair complexion, a slight moustache, and wore dark clothes. On the 15th of November, a constable on night duty in Oldham noticed that the front door of a property had been forced open, which seemed to him obviously suspicious, and on searching the place found a man who corresponded with the description of the murderer published in the newspapers. The man was taken into custody and he gave his name as John Ward. But when at the police station, admitted that in fact he was Cornelius Howard, and that he had no fixed abode, having previously been in the army. He was questioned about his movements on November the 1st, and in reply made a statement that he had been in a pub in Huddersfield from around 9 o'clock in the evening until well past 10.30 and not only could the landlord vouch for this, but he was also with four friends throughout the time. Whether this statement was true or not remained to be seen. Meanwhile, the suspicions against him were strengthened by finding that his left leg was cut and scratched, and his explanation as to how he came about these injuries was proved to be false. He was also picked out by Miss Linley, and by Mrs. Stalls, as the man they saw. The absence of a moustache on his face being accounted for by an Oldham hairdresser, who said that on the morning November the 2nd, he shaved off the moustache of a man who closely resembled the prisoner. In the face of such evidence, it was inevitable that Howard should be committed for trial at Chester Assizes. The crucial point was his identification and while Mrs. Stalls was nervous and hesitating, she had no doubt Howard was the man. Miss Linley, on the other hand, was calm and positive that the prisoner was the murderer. No further evidence was offered against Howard, except proof that the explanation he had given for the cause of his cuts and scratches was untrue, his story being that he had helped to put in a pane of glass, that the glass had fallen, and so had injured his leg. He then went into the witness box and admitted that his story concerning his cuts were untrue. He had told it because he did not want the real circumstances known. The fact was that he had received them while attempting to break into a shop in Stallybridge, the wound being caused by a broken window. He had seen Mr. Stall some months before the murder, but did not speak to him as... After the death of his mother, who was Mrs. Storr's relative, he considered the connection between the two families was closed. He had no grievance of any kind against Storr's. The explanation sounded reasonable, but Howard's trump card was his alibi. 
It was proved by three witnesses that he was in the Ring of Bells on the night of November the 1st, as he had stated, and that between 8.30 and 9, he was talking to a man named Thompson on the steps of the election committee rooms in Huddersfield. After this, no one was surprised when Howard was declared to be not guilty, after 30 minutes' deliberation by the jury. The police were back to square one again, until they had what they thought was a lucky break. On June the 10th, 1910, near to Gorse Hill, a couple were attacked by a man with a knife. Luckily, their injuries were not serious, and from the description they gave to the police, realised that it was very similar to the one connected to George Storr's murder. Subsequent inquiries led them to arrest a man named Mark Wilde. He was found guilty of the attack on the couple and sentenced to two months in prison. On his release, he was immediately arrested in connection to the murder of Storrs. It was discovered on the evening of the murder, Wilde had not turned up to work. When it came to the trial at Chester of Sizes, by chance he was defended by the same barrister that had managed to get an acquittal for Cornelius Howard. The barrister argued that since Howard, who allegedly had been identified as the murderer, had been acquitted, then his client, Wilde, had no business being in court. After 50 minutes of deliberation, the jury agreed and Wilde was released. It is interesting to note that Wilde and Howard met up the following day for a celebratory drink. At the time, other rumoured suspects were put forward. Two foreign-looking men had been seen in the area prior to the murder and disappeared the following day. Could they be relatives of Maria Hull seeking revenge for her association with Storrs and her suicide? It was even suggested that Maggie Storrs had hired someone to kill her husband because she was fed up with his philandering. Did George Storrs' brother James have something to do with it in order to take control of the building company? Mark Wilde had a compelling case against him, even though he gave his mother as his alibi in court. After all, he did have a conviction for violence with a knife. Then there is Cornelius Howard, the errant cousin. But at the end of the day, he had no real motive. A year after the murder, Maggie Storrs had Gorse Hall demolished. George Storrs did not appear to have any enemies, was on good terms with his employees, took an active part in the community, and was highly respected. Why he was done to death must forever remain unresolved. <laughs>